sustain. To openly signify support and approval by vote or affirmation, for example, when seven women sustain a man to use his priesthood outside his own family for the benefit of the fellowship. To support as true, legal, or just. Or to allow or admit a proposal as valid. Not used in the sense of providing temporal support or relief or supplying sustenance. The LDS tradition is to ordain to the priesthood at age 12, and that has become the standard. There is compelling evidence that both Jesus and John were initiated into the temple at age 12 before the Passover in essentially what would today be called a bar mitzvah. It was important for Jesus to be at the temple at the age of 12 for that initiation. For a youth to be ordained, at least seven women must vote to sustain him to be a priest, which would, of necessity, include the mother because she would be most acquainted with his daily walk. And again, the husband is to hold priesthood to baptize and bless the sacrament of bread and wine in the home, and the husband and wife are to bless their children together. For the husband to use authority to administer outward ordinances outside his own family, his wife must sustain him. Sustaining of priesthood within a fellowship is by women, and removing authority to act within a community or fellowship is, likewise, to be done by the vote of women. See also the glossary entries, Worthy Unworthy. Common Consent Symbols God intended symbols to convey glory, honor, and a gift or endowment upon the people who received them. The symbols are not the real thing, but they teach and point to the real thing that is required for salvation. Symbolism substitutes one thing to represent another. There is always this that stands in the place of that. The value of the symbol is in teaching about that by employing this as a teaching tool. In temple symbolism, that this used has no real value, but that holds eternal value. If an unbelieving person obtains access to this temple symbol but fails to understand its relationship to that which is eternal, they have nothing of value. Likewise, when the symbol of this has no meaning for those who believe in the temple, then it fails to have any value for the believer as well. God's highest truths frequently use symbols. Christ used parables to teach about that by using the familiar to substitute as a representation. He explained that this was to prevent those who were unworthy of the symbol from comprehending the truths. Seeing, they see not, and hearing, they hear not. See Matthew 7, paragraph 2 and Mark 2, paragraph 13. Merely getting this without understanding that is worthless. Temple rites are a gift from God that is filled with this for that. Ignorance leads to apostasy because the ignorant cannot see that this holds powerful value to teach about that. Even the greatest symbols can become nothing when they are not understood and are discarded by the ignorant. Then they shall return again to their own place, to enjoy that which they are willing to receive, because they were not willing to enjoy that which they might have received. For what does it profit a man if a gift is bestowed upon him, and he receive not the gift? Behold, he rejoices not in that which is given unto him, neither rejoices in him who is the giver of the gift. TNC 86, paragraph 4. Synagogue A public worship place of the Jews. The building in which worship is done. From the Greek. Synagogi. Literally a bringing together, an assembling. See also the glossary entry. Church. Take away our reproach. The prophecy of being called by thy name, as a fulfillment of Isaiah 1, paragraphs 12 to 13, and 2 Nephi 8, paragraph 8, refers to the name of Christ. Seven women sustaining a man to priesthood precedes the ordinance of baptism itself. When baptized, one takes upon him or her the name of Christ. It is the name of Christ through baptism that will take away one's reproach or, in other words, provide the remission of sins, as mentioned in Isaiah 1, paragraph 13. Taken captive by the devil. To know nothing concerning God's mysteries. Alma 9, paragraph 3. 
When a person knows nothing concerning God's mysteries, they are then taken captive by the devil and led by his will down to destruction. When they are taken captive by their ignorance, they are bound by the chains of hell. The result of ignorance of God's mysteries is destruction and captivity. The ignorant will remain devoted to falsehoods, blind leaders, and guides who give no truthful accounts of their awful situation because they do not understand truth. They are all left without repentance, because repentance requires knowledge. See also the glossary entry, Chains of Hell. Take the name of the Lord in vain. Attributing something to God without His authority or authorization. Not swearing, but rather, when one claims to speak for the Lord when they do not. Whenever someone proclaims their own agenda in the name of the Lord. All ought to speak in the Lord's name the words of eternal life. Unfortunately, many pretended saints instead speak idle words, gratify their pride, and exercise their vain ambition while using the Lord's name only in vain. The Lord has instructed us, Wherefore, let all men beware how they take my name in their lips, for behold, verily I say that many there be who are under this condemnation, who use the name of the Lord and use it in vain, having not authority, TNC 50, paragraph 14. The expression my God, people, is akin to Joseph Smith's exasperated comment to James Arlington Bennett, Great God. When shall the oppressor cease to pray and glut itself upon innocent blood? This is not taking the name of God in vain because first, in both cases, God's name is not used. Second, neither involves advancing untruth while vainly attempting to empower falsehood by attributing it to God. And third, it dramatically calls attention to the importance of the surrounding statement and, hopefully, makes it all the more memorable. These are serious matters deserving one's complete attention. Teach, teacher. To impart light and truth to another. In the Book of Mormon, teachers were ordained by the power of the Holy Ghost to preach repentance and remission of sins through Jesus Christ by the endurance of faith on his name to the end, Moroni 3, paragraph 1. See also the glossary entry, Ruler. Temple. Where heaven and earth meet, both symbolically and literally. The purpose of a temple, meaning an actual temple that is commissioned, ordered, blessed, accepted, and visited with his presence, is to substitute for the temporary ascent of a mortal into God's presence. A real temple becomes holy ground and the means for making available to faithful people in every state of belief and hope the opportunity to receive, by authorized means, the same covenant, obligation, association, expectation, and sealing through an authorized and binding arrangement in sacred space. This is the same thing they can receive from God directly if they enter into His presence while still in the flesh. In effect, the temple becomes an extension of heaven. God, angels, and mankind are able to associate there as in Eden. It is a return to Eden, where God walks in the cool of the day, Genesis 2, paragraph 17. The ordinances or rites of the temple are presented in ritual form. This is required. God's house is a house of order because it is reoriented to point away from this world in order to reflect the order of heaven and the actual eternal ascent into his presence. The volume of information conveyed by God would be too vast to set out in non-ritual form. In ritual, it is possible to convey a great body of information with symbolism, metaphor, relationships, and types that work on the mind of man the same way that visionary experiences directly with God convey. The mind is expanded, and the ritual allows something of God's viewpoint to be transmitted into the mind of man. The temple has only one real purpose, to convey God's promise to exalt those who experience it, provided they abide the conditions for exaltation. It portrays the real, second eternal form of ascent in a way that gives the initiate a promise, that if they walk in the path shown them, they will arrive at the throne of God in the afterlife. The whole temple message can be summarized in one brief statement, we are to be prepared in all things to receive further light and knowledge by conversing with the Lord through the veil. The ceremony of the temple is not the real thing. It is a symbol of the real thing. 
The real thing is when a person actually obtains an audience with Jesus Christ, returns to his presence, and gains knowledge by which they are saved. The temple is a revelation of the process by which one may pass through the veil to God's actual presence. The purpose of a temple is to allow the communication of great knowledge and greater knowledge to restore what has been lost since the time of Adam in order for people to rise up and receive the holy order. A temple in Zion is to be a place where he can come to dwell and not merely to manifest himself to some. Isaiah's prophecy concerning the last day's temple clearly identifies it as a house where man will be instructed in God's path, see Isaiah 1, paragraph 5. It will be a facility where the God of Jacob will teach his pathway of ascent back to the throne of God. Mankind will learn the laws governing that pathway. The purpose of the coming last day's temple in Zion is to allow the communication of great knowledge and greater knowledge, and to restore what has been lost since the time of Adam. In the answer to prayer for covenant the Lord explained, Whenever I have people who are mine, I command them to build a house, a holy habitation, a sacred place where my presence can dwell or where the Holy Spirit of promise can minister, because it is in such a place that it has been ordained to recover you, establish by my word and my oath your marriages, and endow my people with knowledge from on high that will unfold to you the mysteries of godliness, instruct you in my ways, that you may walk in my path. And all the outcasts of Israel will I gather to my house, TNC 157, paragraph 41. The main requirement of temples is to organize the living into a family. The organization cannot happen outside a temple. That is the only place God will allow the restoration, rites, ordinances, and covenant to be ministered. Heaven and earth will reunite and angels will attend to many of the required things when an acceptable temple has been built. We think a temple can be built following a pattern based on current ordinances. There is no understanding of the ordinances necessary to organize the family of God again. Trying to fit the original full plan of God for mankind into our incomplete and corrupt model and make it conform to our expectations will not work. There has not been a full restoration as yet. Temptation all can fill themselves with the mind of God, and if they do so, they will find themselves, as the scriptures recite, having no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually, Mosiah 3, paragraph 1. This kind of repentance comes as a consequence of the things one knows, as a consequence of the light and truth within one. It causes temptation to disappear because one gives it no heed. This is how the Lord overcame all temptations. He suffered temptations, but gave no heed unto them, Joseph Smith History Part 16, Paragraph 6. When someone gives heed to his temptations, he loses the battle our Lord won. It is possible to live in a world filled with sin and avoid becoming embroiled in the errors. Do not let your eyes focus on the wickedness you see around you, but look up to heaven and the example of heaven's God, where there is no corruption. Testify. Therefore, hold up your light, that it may shine unto the world. Behold, I am the light which ye shall hold up, that which ye have seen me do. Behold, ye see that I have prayed unto the Father, and ye all have witnessed. And ye see that I have commanded that none of you should go away, but rather have commanded that ye should come unto me, that ye might feel and see. Even so shall ye do unto the world. And whosoever breaketh this commandment suffereth himself to be led into temptation, 3 Nephi 8, paragraph 8. When admonished earlier to let your light so shine before this people, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, what the Lord meant is that it is he who should be held up. 3 Nephi 5, paragraph 21. He alone. Not you, or your good intentions, your conspicuous acts or philanthropy. Not you at all. Him. The obligation to hold up a light is circumscribed by God's direction that he is the light which he shall hold up. Nothing and no one else. He is the lifeline. Therefore, when anyone offers, preaches, teaches, exhorts, and expounds, he must be at the center of the prophesying, or the one prophesying is engaging in priestcraft. See 2 Nephi 11. 
paragraph 17. The Lord prayed unto the Father in the Nephite's presence. 3rd Nephi 8, paragraph 4. His example points to how prayer is to occur and to whom it is addressed. They all witnessed this and knew for themselves how it was to be done. He did not tell any of those who were present to go away. He brought the same message to all. He gave them his example of liberality, Ye see that I have commanded that none of you should go away, but rather have commanded that ye should come unto me. 3rd Nephi 8, paragraph 8. No one was refused. All were welcomed. Whether those in the multitude thought someone was unworthy or whether there were some with conflicts, it did not matter. All were invited. None were refused. They were all commanded that they should come unto him. What is the reason we are commanded to come to him? It is so ye might feel and see. So that you might know him. So that you can also be a witness of his physical evidence of suffering, crucifixion and death. The wounds he bears could not be received without death. His body testifies that he died. His body also testifies of his resurrection. Despite the wounds which memorialize his suffering and death, he lives. He stands before you in life. He has risen. As you testify of him, you must invite others to likewise come that they might feel and see him. This is how witnesses of him are commanded to do unto the world. This is their ministry, their burden, their witness, and their command from him. When they fail to testify, teach, and proclaim, they break this commandment and suffer themselves to be led into temptation. This is why the Lord required at my hands the book The Second Comforter. That is how he directs all those who are commanded to come unto him, that they might feel and see. It will not be in vague innuendo or veiled language. It may not be in a published book, and may well be in private. But they will all be required to invite others to likewise come unto him that everyone might feel and see our risen Lord. He is accessible. He invites. More than that, he commands. All are commanded and none of you should go away. We think it a great thing when someone testifies of him. Yet he wants all to come so that everyone might feel and see him. Anyone who has had the Lord appear to them should testify as a witness to that fact. That is paramount. It is important for witnesses to declare he lives and that they have seen him. What is not appropriate for disclosure are details that go beyond what the Lord has chosen to make public already through the scriptures or ordinances. He controls that. Though he may reveal much to a person and place them under a different standard than what is given openly to mankind, that is his decision. Until he commands, the line is drawn between witnessing he lives, which is required, and disclosing what he alone reserves for himself to reveal, which is forbidden. I have said and I do believe our Lord has a continuing ministry. But that is his, not mine. Like anyone with a testimony of the Lord, I testify to help my fellow man increase in faith in Jesus Christ. I have an obligation to do so. We all do. Everyone has a duty to testify of the truth and to teach one another the doctrines of the kingdom. Therefore, all are under some obligation to declare what they believe, explain why, and defend it using the scriptures and declarations of the prophets.